All right. Can you guys see it now online? Good to go. All right. So here was the only graphic that y'all missed online. Just the two different spore uh, slides at different magnifications showing the hyphae emerging and the beginning of mycelium forming. So where to start? Field guides are a great place to start. Uh, we have two really good mycologists on the East Coast, Alan and Arlene Bissett. They have a lot of books um, on different types of mushrooms. So you have milk caps, wax caps, boletes. Uh, they have an ASO book, asomyces. Um, they have quite a few. I think there's a lot I don't have because they're out of print, but they are very, very cool people, very intelligent, and they work with a lot of other cool mycologists to make these books and get them out there. Um, but no matter where you are in the country, there's going to be a field guide for your general area, or if not, very close. So those are good to have. As far as websites, mushroomobserver.org and iNaturalist are both great resources for not only comparing finds, but narrowing down finds by date and range. So if you find a mushroom and you want to know if it, or if you see a mushroom and want to know if it grows in your area, you can go to either of these websites, type in the name of the mushroom, and then look at the map, and it'll show you where these observations came from. And then you can also narrow it down by time of year. So it's a very, very helpful tool. And of course, there's mycology groups. There's the North American Mycological Association. We have Central Texas Myco Mycological here. There's the Alabama Society. Uh, Kentucky has a Bluegrass Mycological Society. There's plenty of them, and they're always doing something. All right, so defining features. The easiest way to identify a mushroom will be by their macro features or features visible to the naked eye. So let's go over some of those now. First thing that's easy to narrow down is the type of spore bearing surface it has. So agarics, fleshy and spore bearing gills, what most people call mushrooms, what most people think of when they hear the word mushroom. We have ch chanterelles and trumpets, fleshy with spore bearing wrinkles and or ridges. And we have boletes, fleshy with spore bearing pores or tubes. And here's an example of nagaric. This is a Clitosophy species, probably subconexa. And then here's a bolete, Sulis uh, discipiens. There are polypores. They're usually bracket shaped. They grow on wood. And they're tough to woody flesh with spore bearing tubes or pores. A lot like a bolete, much firmer, usually don't grow on the ground. There are crust fungi, fleshy to tough. They grow flat on a substrate and they produce spores all over. And we have tooth fungi, fleshy to tough with spore bearing teeth. Oh, that is cut out a little bit. That is a polypore. Yes, ma'am. And we have coral, uh, corals and clubs, fleshy to firm, and they produce spores all over. So here's another shot of that polypore in the first picture, the top left one. This is uh, Truncospora mexicana. And this is a tooth fungus, which I can't get a consensus on. And here's an earth tongue, kind of a club fungus. And so there's going to be a lot of variation between, you know, tooth fungus, club fungus, coral fungus, all that. It's just important to know kind of around about what they are. So when you find a mushroom, you definitely want to note the size and color. Uh, size is often noted, but not usually measured by beginners, but it can be very helpful, even though some descriptions of sizes are, you need to take with a grain of salt, depending on what they are and where they were described from, because sometimes as they go out, to a different environment, they will grow a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, just depending on what they have available. So the cap, you want to get the width of that. You want to get the length of the stem, the stem width, 
and the depth or length of the spore bearing surface. So how deep the gills are or pores or teeth. Those can be very useful, especially the pores. A lot of polypores are pretty difficult to identify if you don't know them very well, but cutting them in half and looking at how deep the uh, pores themselves are can be pretty useful. You want to note the cap color, note any transitions and their location. So is it going from dark to light from the edge inward or vice versa? The gill color, you want to note overall gill color, any variations. If it's splotchy, like a lot of Sathurella, uh, they're called modal gills, and they have like splotchy coloration on there. That happens with a few other species, I think one Deconica. And in the stem, note color from top to bottom, including any features like rings, hairs, vulva, reticulation, or rhizomorphs. The cap shape. You want to note if it's applinate, so if it's plain, almost like a plate, if there's no real rounding to it. If it's conic, shaped like a cone, pointy on top, and the margin not usually flared, the margin's going to be the end, the very bottom of the cap. And they're usually taller than they are wide. And we have convex, which is regularly rounded, like an upside down bowl, usually wider than it is tall. And as a copernopsis, they're kind of conical when they start off. They usually get upturned later on. And this is a Cortinarius species. They're generally convex, so they have a good bowl shape to them. So a parabolic mushroom is going to be regularly rounded, but much taller than it is wide. So this uh, Coprinus comatus is a good example of that. Other ones in Coprinus as well tend to do that. In fundibiliform with a strong central like depression or funnel. So I didn't get the opposite side of this mushroom, which is in fundibilicide, but they do look very funneled. So some mushrooms will have a slight depression. This one will have one that looks like it goes straight down into the stipe. And a cap can be umbinate. So having a central bump or protrusion, the umbo can also be described as broad or narrow depending on the diameter. And it's called cuspidate when it's really elongated and kind of pointy, which you will see on like some lactarius, menaluca, stuff like that. So here's another example of infundibiliform. This is Panis lexomii. And then here's a slightly umbinate one. This is a Deconica species. And you can barely tell with this one because sometimes the coloration and the light will make it hard to see, but that one is definitely slightly umbinate, enough to be a feature. So campanulate, somewhat bell-shaped with a flared margin. The end of the cap usually becomes upturned and a rounded top, so it won't be real pointy or flat or have a depression. Like this one, which has a pretty clear central depression. This is a uh, Lentinus auricularis. Um, so they can be shallow, deep, broad, or narrow, just depending. So here we have another one with a central depression. This is Geronema subclavatum. Yes. Uh, a majority of these were found in either San Marcos, Austin, or Buda. There are a few from out of state, but most of these, yeah, were here. So we do have a lot of stuff here when it rains. So the pileal shape, the shape of the cap, if it's ovoid, it's round or circular. So a lot of uh, Rusula and Lactarius will be fairly round. They can be petaloid, shaped like a petal. So this is a pretty common one around here. It's a Hohenna behalia petaloides. And it's really common in mulch and um, any sort of ground that has like a lot of duff or litter. It looks a lot like an oyster, does not taste good like one though. Yes, that is a typo. What was the other one? Back. 
and demodate semicircular. So here's another Hohenna petaloids. And then here's an ovoid circular one. This is Crinopellus zonata. So they can be spatulate, shaped like a spatula. So there are a lot of little jellies that look like that, a lot of stuff in the Dacromyces family. They can be concate, shaped like a shell. So that's usually referring to oysters, um, pleurotus species. Uh, we have a few other some Pinellus and Phyllotopsis that look similar, but they're differently enough colored and textured to not be confused. But they would have an oyster shape. Flabiliform, shaped like a fan. So here's another close up of that. Um, I was going to say Dacryo pinax, but they changed it again. So it's Dacromyces spathularia. And then here's that Pinellus stipticus, which is another oysterling shaped one. So here we have the margin shape. So the margin, again, is going to be the bottom of the cap. And they can be crenated or scalloped, which is just regularly wavy or scalloped finely wavy or scalloped, and broadly wavy or scalloped. So these are all pretty much the same. And if you notice on the pictures, the um, intervals with which it does that have a lot to do with how many gills there are. So the more spread, ap spread apart the gills are, the more distant they are, usually the broader the sweep is. And so with mushrooms that do that, that have a lot of gills or closely uh, spaced gills, you'll have a very finely like crenulate. So this is a copernellus, a little broader. And this is more on the margin shape. Irregular interruptions not occurring regularly. That would be eroded. Um, that can also happen with age. Sometimes they just form like that. It can be appendiculate with patches or pieces of partial veil still attached to it. And remose, like eroded, but the irregular portions lead to radial splits along the pileus. So that's real common among things in Anasobaceae. So like Anasobi, Pseudosperma, Inosperma, and I think Nothosobi, which are notoriously difficult to identify. So if you get it down to genus, just thumbs up it and go on. So here's an appendiculate one. This is a Luso agaricus lusothides. And this one I often don't find with this uh, material on the margin right there. So it's kind of cool to get a picture of that. But as you can see, this stuff was connected to this ring right here. And it's just leftovers. Didn't peel away evenly. So the margin surface can be striate, which is having visible lines running radially, radially along the margin. This is pretty common with some sections of Amanita, uh, a lot of Lusocoprinus. Um, it's a fairly neat feature, adds a little bit of pop to it. Some are only like that due to the moisture content of the cap. So they'll be pelucid or translucent striate. So when they dry out, you're not going to see that, but because of the moisture content of the cap, it'll be a little bit see-through or opaque, and you can see where the gills are, and that's creating that striation. So sulcate, the striate form grooves along the margin, having depth, not just superficial. So like this one over here on the left, this is an amanita, and they're visible, but you can't really feel them, whereas this one definitely has some depth to it. And plicate striate is having folds between the striae. So this has one big fold and then one small one in between each one, which is more common on some um, Sathorielaceae species. So like um, 
Caprinus, Satheriella, Copernopsis, Copernellus. Here's one, uh, Copernellus section Dissemantii. These guys have striations that go almost to the center and they have slight depression. And then here's a Floeomana species, which are the translucent striate. So once these dry out, that's not visible anymore. And all you have is sort of a color change from the uh, margin to the disc, which is the center of the cap. So the surface look, I didn't add an animation for that one. It can look shiny or polished. It can be dull, lacking any luster. It can be viscid, feeling sticky or looking sticky. And silky, which is kind of in between, usually due to hyphae creating small little hairs. So here's another viscid one. This is a Zuliangomyces, which is a mushroom we get here in San Marcos and surrounding areas that is closely related to Amanita. Um, but it's, it's a pretty interesting one. It's extremely slimy and it's very hard to pick up. Not as far as I know, but the last I looked at that one, it was in a different genus altogether. So I don't know too much about those. And then here is a gymnopus in section in Puticae, growing out of an acorn shell. And that's going to be, you know, dull, lackluster. Okay, so dry, feeling as if there's no moisture. A lot of uh, russula and lactarius are going to be that way. The tigrophonus, the cap and peleus are going to dry, and the colors are going to change kind of drastically between the dry and the still moist part. So here on this one, you can see all this purple right there, and that's due to it drying out. So the more it dries out, the more that color is going to creep in. And it becomes less and less apparent until it just goes away and you have it pretty much one color. And they can be glutinous and lubricious, so feeling oily or slippery, slippery or having a coating of liquid like slime or glue. So as far as I know, we get that uh, geolangomyces here that does that, maybe a limicella, which are both two that are closely related to Amanita and I'm not sure which ones go where, but they're very similar. And then we have um, a very common one out here, Otomenciella, uh, section Radicate. And that one's fairly common. It pops up in lawns a lot. It has a stipe that will just kind of snap. But if you try and pull it out of the ground, it has a rooting structure. And they can be, here's one right here, um, either extremely viscid or glutinous uh, or completely dry and smooth. So there's a lot of variation in those. When you find them fresh, they're usually pretty sticky. And then here's another dry one. This is a Putea cervinus, deer shield mushroom, pretty common around here as well. So surface texture. Is it smooth, free of wrinkles, cracks? Do scrobiculate, shallow pitting of the surface. So I went ahead and included this one because it can happen with some lactarius on the cap, but it generally happens only on the stipe. So you can kind of see it a little bit right there. Not a great example, but... And then aviolate, deeply scrobiculate, deeply pitted, or lacunose, lacunose, deeply pitted, scrobiculate, surrounded by ridges. So they're kind of raised little potholes instead of just divots. So a lacunate mushroom is going to be splitting into segments. You can see that a lot with uh, Cethriella, Candylomyces. And Pluteus, like right there. They can be areolate, excessive splitting in all directions that result in a dried mud look. So I happen to see that a lot on uh, Boletus and Xerocamellus, which I think this one is a Xerocamellus. 
It happens sometimes with some Rusula too. They get some pretty neat patterns. A lot of the green ones will have that sort of texture to them. So rivulos and rugos are just two different words for different types of irregular lines. Usually you can put either one to it if it's not fitting one particularly better than the other. I just throw both on there with a slash. But a lot of agrosophy species we have out here will do that when very young. And there's also one, I can't remember the name of, but it's supposed to look like that when mature. And I think all the names kind of get thrown around uh, incorrectly on that. And then Ramos splitting extending past the outer cuticle. So I think we covered that one already, but yeah, that's when it's not just the top splitting like the areolate, it's actually going into the flesh of the mushroom underneath and causing an entire split. So the cap will sometimes have hyphae that orient themselves in different ways. And unlike the previous slide, this one pertains to textures on top of the surface and not the texture of the surface itself. So they can have superficial, having a feature that doesn't persist with age, think warts on an amanita like this one, or innate features, having features that persist with age, like the scales on this gymnopolis fulvosquamulosus. So these can get washed away pretty easily and it can make identifying them a little more difficult, um, especially if you don't have much else to go on. But then with stuff like this, Gymnopolis, a lot of uh, foliota, stuff like that, these features will stick around and they have to take quite a beating from the rain to actually wash those off. So here's another one with some superficial scales and vellum. This is a Lucicoprinus cretaceus. And those also can be washed off very easily. Those little gray dots were the pieces? Yes, ma'am. Um, this one? Yes. So these little guys right here. And then a good feature note on this one is towards the center, they pick up a little bit of pigmentation. So they're a little brown up there, but that can all be washed off with rain. So if I were to find this one and it didn't have any of those features, I would be a little more confused and it would take me a little longer to figure out what it is. So volutinous, they can have the look and feel of velvet. A lot of vulvariella will have that. Um, they're a saprophytic species. They're gonna grow off of dead wood. Um, some of them are edible and pretty tasty, but I really like just touching the fuzz on the top of the cap. And then I stuck pubescent with that one. Uh, it's pretty much the same, but the hairs are a little bit shorter. Glabrous, bald, or smooth, like this uh, Lapista nuda, the wood bluet. Flocculose, having small woolly or cottony tufts. And tomentose, having densely woolly patches. So a lot of these are just same words for like different degrees of the same feature. And we have, I don't know why it's doing that. It shows it in this one. Can you read the one at the top? Is it glabrous? Yes, ma'am. G-L-A-B-R-O-U-S. And then what's the woolly spot based the top? Flocculose, F-L-O-C-C. U L O S E. I don't know how to adjust that. Okay. So this is a uh, Amanita polypyramus, and it's going to have these big granulose um, particles all over it. And one like this is going to be superficial. Uh, after handling this one, it was all over my hands and you could see thumbprints in it. But a lot of Amanita are going to have some sort of what they call vellum. So they come in a universal veil. Most Amanita will emerge from what looks like an egg. 
and then that breaks up into different parts. So the bottom of the egg becomes the vulva, which they grow out of. The middle part, which was covering the gills, becomes the veil. And then you have little spots all over the top, which are um, velar remnants. And this one looks like this all over. Sometimes they're a little more pointy. Sometimes they're a little thicker. Uh, like, it's the Amanita persicina, the one that looks like Amanita muscaria those warts on top it's the same thing it's just they're a little more adherent they're a little thicker and they're a little bit bigger pieces and they do break apart in a different pattern and then here's a close-up of that uh lizocoprinus cretaceous So squamos and squamulose, it's a scaly surface. It's just small or regular sized. Perforation is covered in bran-like structures. So a lot of chlorophyllum will do that. We have um, chlorophyllum hortens, molybdites, and racodes are all pretty common around here, or maybe sub -racodes. And they can be fibrillose, which is covered in little tiny fibers that look like hairs. And so this is probably a clydophilus. And then going on from that one, just different levels. We have hirsute having stiff and flexible hairs or strigos having bristle-like hairs. So this one's pretty common around here. It's a polypore called hexagonia hydnoides. And I believe it's hardwood, grows on oak mainly, um, but they're, they have very persistent fruit bodies. So they will grow and then dry out and kind of just stay there for a year or more if they're not touched. And here's another furforaceous one. This is a chlorophyllum albidides. But you can see, just think cereal bran. So odor and taste, pleasant and unpleasant, agreeable and disagreeable. They're kind of up to the individual person. So it's best just to use broad terms if you can. Some things it, you will need to say like, yes, this smells like almonds or this smells like cherries. But usually if you wanna say it smells sweet or pleasant, you wanna say it's fragrant. Uh, smelling of anise smells like licorice. Raffinoid smells like a radish. Vivacious smells like beans. And as far as tastes, mild used to describe many flavors like mildly fruity, mildly fishy. Peppery, just how it sounds. Spice like capsaicin. Acrid, sharp or harshly flavored. And latent tastes. Any flavor can be latent or become pronounced after you've tasted the mushroom. Could you this up for yes, certainly. So a lot of acrid mushrooms, uh, like certain lactarius, um, if you slice the gills or break them, a little bit of latex will exude from it, and you can taste that. And a lot of times you won't get much, but then sometimes it'll be really spicy, and then sometimes you'll think you have nothing, and then you throw it away, and then like a minute or two later it i don't know how to describe that burn it's not spicy spicy it's not good spicy but it's like a almost chemical kind of feeling Well, good. All right, and here's just some smells and genera associated with them. So photid, smelling of benzaldehyde, a chemical with bitter almond odor. Uh, Michael Kuo describes the scent as rotten maraschino cherries. So there's a group of russula that have that smell. Russula, sorry. 
bleach and chlorine associated with certain species of Mycena, Amanita, and Merasmius. Um, that's a pretty easy one. I don't know why people necessarily differentiate the two. Like, we should just say chlorine because bleach has chlorine in it, and that's the smell. Um, but some people do use bleach instead of chlorine as the scent. Uh, anise smelling of licorice, uh, certain agaricus are going to smell like this. Green corn, certain species of inosibi are going to smell like that. So kind of a starchy sort of scent. Apricots found in some species of cantharellus. I have never gotten this. It's everywhere in the resources online and books. I've gotten sweet smell, but I've never smelled apricots. And I have other people who have agreed. So if you can tell that it's like kind of sweet scented, that's probably fine. Petroleum or gas, some species of tricholoma or tricholoma. And fishy. So there are Russula and Lactarius that both smell fishy. And it's super pleasant. So if you do have something like a um, Lactarius or a certain Amanita, or there are a lot of mushrooms actually that will stain, you want to take note of that. So what color is it staining? Where on the fruit body is it staining? How strong is it staining? How quickly? And does it fade to a different color? And pretty much all those can be applied to the latex as well. There is latex that when you slice a mushroom, comes out white or clear, turns yellow, turns pink. Um, the taste, like you're never gonna get one that's gonna make you sick just by tasting a little bit of the latex. So that's never an issue, uh, but it can be very helpful in figuring out what you have. All right, so now we're gonna talk about gill attachment and spacing. So when the mushroom has free gills, they are not attached to the stem. So they end and upturn back into the cap. When they're adnexed, they're narrowly attached to the stem. So think about something real wide coming out like that and then just barely attaching at the bottom. So there's a little bit of material that attaches it to the stem. Yes, this is free. Yes, so that one's narrowly attached. So it's attaching to the base right before the base attaches to the cap. So it's a very thin amount. So on a lot of these, you will have to either cut them in half or like kind of peel them to be able to see what it is. And then sinuate is notched before attachment. So it'll have a big swoop in it before it goes back to the stem. And then adnate is attaching widely to the stem. So just think about the gills coming in at a 90 degree to the stem. So this is a Plutus cervinus and it has free gills. All species in this genus are gonna be free gilled. And then here is a Hebeloma species, which are very notched, which is a good identifying feature for that genus. Um, that's about as far as I go with them, because apparently you're supposed to count the individual gills, and that can get you a good one, a good ID. I'm not about to do that. So when you said notched, where the gills, like up at the top left corner, the gills are not and hitting the stem, I, I just am not getting them off. It just means it's at a deep angle. Uh, it's so between notched and adnexed. So adnexed is going to be one like constant swoop, like the plane that's going on is going to be like that. Whereas if it's um, sinuate, it's going to do that and then do a secondary sort of curve.
Okay, so the gills can also be seceding, um, attached but breaking away with age. So you can see here along the actual flesh right here that these are starting to peel away and they're not fully connected. Decurrent gills, they begin to run down the stem. So they can be decurrent, subdecurrent, which means just barely decurrent or uh, connected to the stem with a decurrent tooth, which is just a little line coming down the stem from the in individual gills. And then gill spacing, they can be distant like this mycena, subdistant like this mycena, close like this gymnopolis, or crowded like this amanita. So here's Mycena meliagena, which has distant gills. A lot of the times you're going to see that on smaller mushrooms. So Merasmias, Merasmioids, uh, Mycena, stuff like that. They generally will have further spaced out gills just because they're smaller and they couldn't pack that many gills in there and still be able to let their spores be dispersed, catch air currents, and actually travel any amount of distance. Here's a Gironema subclavatum, which has uh, decurrent gills. I start running down the stem. All right, and gills can be smooth, which is uniformly uninterrupted. So a lot of Rusula and a lot of Lactarius are like that. There's not, there's barely any variation between the gills from one to the other. So these all look pretty much the same. They can be serrated like a bread knife. So a lot of um, lentinus and neolentinus have that. A lot of wood lovers. And then crenate, crisp, and undulating are all just same thing at different levels. So regularly wavy or scalloped, regularly wavy with small sweeps, regularly wavy with broad sweeps. Right. And so when a gill edge is marginate, it's going to show a different color than the side of the gill. So the gill face is where all the basidia are and all the spores are being produced. So it's going to get a color change on there usually. And then so they rarely have them on the uh, gill edge, and that's when you get marginate gills. So they'll either retain the original color of the gills while the rest of it changes, or they'll just be a different color altogether. And we have er or sorry, eroded gills, which are just irregularly wavy, possibly torn. Fimbriate which is looking slightly fringed. I don't know how well you can see that, but there's just a little bit of material hanging off of that one. Pretty similar to this Deconica species. Has a little bit of frill on all the gills. What is the name of the slightly fringed gill? It is Fimbriate, F-I-M. B-R-I-A-T-E. A lot of these names aren't necessarily what you need to remember as long as you remember the description of them. Because uh, even a lot of online resources and even um, field guides that I mentioned earlier, they're not going to have that sort of uh, description in them. That's going to be more like research papers or scientific papers. Um, where they have to prove that mycology is a real science and use big words. Otherwise, they're they're going to describe it in layman's terms. And so as long as you know the about description of it and you can describe it in any sort of way that gets the point across, you're fine. Lamellulae. 
Lamelle, you lead. Not sure. Short gills, not extending the entire length from margin to apex. So you can see here this, I uh, think, Xeromphalina has several rows of intermediate gills. And furcated gills are gills that split or branch irregularly. So you can see this one here splits into two, splits into two, but it doesn't do it the same throughout. And bifurcated gills that split into two only regularly or irregularly. And anastomos, those are cross veins that appear to connect gills. So you can see a little bit right here in this Xeromphalina, which is actually a good identifying feature for that genus. Uh, they tend to have pretty pronounced cross veins. And then in oops, Cantharellus as well. So all your chanterelles, uh, except for the smooth ones, usually have some pretty intense cross veining going on. And that's a good feature to differentiate them from anything else you might find that looks similar. Uh, the cross veining is also a pretty common feature across this family, Merasmusi. Um, so Gymnopus, Merasmus, there's probably like 50 genera in there I don't remember the name of, but it's fairly common, especially in the wider space gill ones, so the smaller ones. All right, so stipe attachment. It can be centrally attached, attached to the middle of the cap, or it can be lateral off to the side, or anything in between can be called eccentric. So here's a Pleuritus species. When I worked at Home Depot and I stole that because it was fruiting on the shelf. Um, they're all going to be usually lateral. Um, I would say a majority of the time they're lateral, but you can definitely find Florida species growing in the wild that are centrally stipate. So the stipe is right in the middle and it will throw you off the first time you see it, but they definitely can do that. What was the substrate on which it was Uh, this one right here? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. It was some sort of grow bag. Uh, I did not read the back of it. I kind of just took it out and put it in a little tub. But I'm assuming some sort of wood. Um, to be fair, maybe not. Pleuritus is, they're not that picky. They can eat just about anything. People have found them eating plastic tools. Um, so yeah, that's one of the mushrooms that they were looking into for micro remediation purposes to uh, eat up plastics. Um, it's interesting, but it seems like it wouldn't work on a large scale, but they're definitely cool mushrooms and they will eat just about anything you give them. All right, so the stipe, the stem, where it connects to the substrate. If it's inserted, it's lacking any unique feature on the point of attachment. So like this Gymnopolis right here. It has basal tomentum, tomentum. I just call it uh, basal mycelium, fuzzy hyphae at the base. So certain ones, they'll have fuzz down at the bottom. If it has a color to it, that can be a useful identifying feature. Pseudoriza, these are root-like structures. So the otomanciella we get here, and this is arula. They all go down into the ground quite a bit. I found one, I think that was about four inches long. They probably go further, but the dirt gets really compacted and it gets hard to get that thin little piece out without breaking it. And then rhizomorphs, long cord-like semi-elastic structures. So we have a species of Gymnopus out here, which is this little tiny guy, Gymnopus spongiosus, and it has bright red hairs like this all over the stem base. And it'll attach itself to just about any piece of oak in the area. So here it's got an acorn that it completely enveloped and it has the uh, 
rhizomorphs coming off to the side that you can see. Here's another picture of Zerula hispida showing the uh, pseudorhiza, or you can just say it has a radicating stalk. So the shape of the stipe, equal, equal in diameter from the base of the cap. So this one, probably slightly tapering, I would say more or less equal. It can be bulbous, having a thickened stipe only at the base, and one with a distinct margin around it or delineation point or a line would be called marginate, a marginate bulb. So that's gonna be pretty common in species of Cortinarius we have around here or they just split that genus. So Portinarius, Phlegmacium, all those other things I don't remember yet. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I think you can kind of see it on this one. It's just like a, a clear delineation from like one point to another. It's not slowly rounding out or anything. And they can be tapered, gradually thicker to one end or the either or the other. And clavate, club shaped. So this can be really exaggerated or not so much. It's really up to you if you want to use certain terms for it. Bulbous is usually more abrupt, where clavate is a more general um, like transition or a smoother transition. So here's a species of melanoleuca. That one has a pretty even stipe. All right, stipe surface and features. So it can be glandular, having tiny colored uh, spots, or scabrous, having a rough stipe due to tiny erected points on the scales, pointed scales. Uh, so this is generally with species like uh, Lechinellum or Lechinum or Suillus, so all different types of boletes. Um, they're the ones that tend to have the granular dots on them. There are other ones here and there. There's a species of Melanoleuca we get here in the States that has a pretty granular stipe, but it's not all that common. So they can be longitudinally striate having fine lines running equidistance longitudinally. So you'll see that with a lot of hygrosophy, gliophorus, and um, mostly entoloma. So if it's got pink spores, pink gills, and a twisted stipe, it's probably an entoloma, like this guy right here. Entoloma. And they can be reticulate, which is having a distinct netted pattern. So that's pretty common on boletes. Um, and it's pretty interesting because if you look at the pattern, it is the same pattern as the pores that the bolete itself will have. And so it's kind of a continuation of it, um, almost like decurrent gills on a regular agaric mushroom. Here's a close up of that Leophorus. So the consistency of the stipe, it can be cartonologous, having a thin stipe that can cleanly break when bent. That's a lot like the Otoman Ciel I was talking about, or the Zerula. Um, it usually has just a little bit of play in it, and then it just snaps pretty clean. Fibrous, having a thick stipe that does not break cleanly. Chalky, having the consistency of chalk becoming granular when crushed. Woody, corky, or leathery, having the consistency of wood, cork, or leather. It can be solid, lacking any cavities inside the stipe. So this can be a really useful feature. Uh, I like to tell people starting out to cut every mushroom you find in half if you don't know what it is, because um, just seeing the uh, color of the inside, the consistency of it, and whether or not it is hollow in the stem can be useful identifying features. 
And you'll also get to see if it bruises any, and that will release really smells a lot easier when you cut or crush it. So hollow, having a cavity in the stipe like a straw or stuffed, which is kind of an intermediate. It usually just has like some fuzzy, looks like pillow stuffing or something inside the hollow cavity. It's just little bits of mycelium and it's usually fairly, fairly faint. There's not a whole lot in there, but sometimes there is. So veils or annulus. Let me go ahead and get a picture up. Membranaceous, having a veil that leaves patches of concentric circle, circles on a stipe as it grows. Let's see. The stipe itself can be superior, central, or inferior, which superior is up high, like this uh, Amnita merirubescence right here, in the middle, or down low inferior. And they can look pretty different. So this one is a chlorophyllum species. And they're going to be like little ring bits, and they're fairly uh, membranous. And I want to say a lot of them, you can kind of like move them around and detach them from the stipe, and they'll become free. And so they're hardy enough to do that, whereas a lot of these other ones are a lot more fragile and can even disappear just from wind and rain. And sometimes you won't even see them when you get there. They can be attached firmly to the stipe. They can be movable. Or it can be a type of veil that you would refer to as a cortina. So it'd have like a spider web or arachnoid type veil. So that's going to be like your gymnopolis, your cortinarius. A lot of those, it's going to have not a veil on the stipe. I'm going to say like a ring zone that's going to have a lot of that wispy sort of mycelium on there. So... Usually with Gymnopolis, they'll have them a little higher up and then Cortinarius, depending on which one it is, they can be anywhere from the bottom of the stipe to the top. But you can see right there, that is all spores caught on that veil remnant. So you can actually, with ones like this, you don't need to take a spore print because you can see the color of the spores right there. And the same with the one behind it, the Gymnopolis, that's all orange caught in that uh, Cortina. No, and that one went to the back. That was another Gymnopolis. So the universal veil, we'll talk about those. This part right here is what an Amanita would emerge from. Uh, there are several other genera that do that as well. Um, but it basically encases and protects the mushroom until it's ready to sprout and sporulate. So they can be adherent with tif uh, tissue that's difficult to remove. They can be free, mostly free from the base. So it's gonna be more outspread, not close. Saccate, loose, looks a lot like a bag. Membranous saccate, saccate, but it's strong and kind of firmer. Limbate. The vulva appears to have an appendage-like section due to splitting or tearing. So I think the ones we have around here that are common with a limbate vulva are going to be the destroying angels, so the ones in section phylloides. Um, I can't remember what else we have here aside from, I think it's a Maravirosa and Disporogera. I'm sure we have other ones, but it's not sure off the top of my head. But they'll usually have a vulva that has a little bit of what looks like a limb, you could call a limb, just a separate, almost petal-like because it's cut or torn. It can be flared at the top, or it can be circumcisile, which is not flared and kind of a tight rim around the vulva. It can be zoned with visible ring zones along its length. So you'll see that a lot in um, Amanita section, Amanita, I think. But like the uh, muscaroid we have around here, the one that looks like um, Amanita muscaria, Amanita persicina, uh, that one has three zones down by its vulva, which is a great identifying feature to separate it from the other closely related ones, because it will always have at least three little zones there. 
and they can be scaly, similar to zone, but irregular in, in occurrence. And Pharanos having a powdery appearance, like that Amanita polypyramids I showed earlier. You could kind of call it that. So here's an Amanita species with a saccate membranous vulva. Here is a Coprinellus showing its universal veil. So it's completely covered in this fuzzy stuff right here and it's gonna grow out and separate. And you'll be able to see it actually has what they call like a pseudo vulva. It's not quite a big structure like on Amanita, but it definitely still has something at the base that shows that it was all sort of connected. And then Vulvariella bombacina. Um, they're gonna be saccate vulva. They're a good edible if you can find them. It's a little weird to eat something that's fuzzy, but they taste good. The growth, you want to note if it's growing solitarily by itself. Sepitose growing from the same mycelial mass. Gregarious, grouped close together. So it's kind of hard to see on these, but this one peels apart real easily. And you can see that the three, or when I did peel it apart, you could see that the three mushrooms were completely separate. There was no like weird tearing. You could see pretty definite like borders of which are each individual stipe. Whereas this one, if you pulled them apart at the bottom, it would just kind of break irregularly and you would be left with just this mass in the middle. So they're all growing from the same chunk there. They're just tightly packed here. And then they can be scattered, the fruit body is usually within a few feet of each other. So here's another clustered one. This is Merasmius coherens. And then one growing by itself, Luso agaricus, Lusothides. So spore color. Brown colors are usually associated with genera like agaricus, bulbidius, gallerina, canosibi, foliota. White colors, Amanita, Omphalatus, Armillaria, Sumphotosibi, and Lapista, Lusopaxillus, Pluridus, and black colors, Paneolus, Sathriella, Caprinus, Capronellus, Capronopsis, Psilocybe, Strafaria, Hypholoma. Um, so generally speaking, if you find a mushroom, odds are it's gonna have white spores. It's just the most common that there is. Um, but on a few of these, let's see, like this, um, if you take good enough notes or have a good enough camera or the mushroom is actually showing you, you don't need to do a spore print because as you can see right here, there's a little spider web caught spores. I can see what color they are. And going back a few, I had a melanoleuca popped up. It had a bunch of white on the stipe. So if you look around enough, you can probably see what color the spores are without having to produce a print. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that if you want to, or if you just want to have a collection, or if you'd like to try to grow it at some point in the future or cultivate it. Um, so if you are going to do a spore print, I recommend just getting a little piece of aluminum foil and then a Tupperware. Just put the mushroom cap on top of the foil, put the Tupperware over it, leave it overnight. When you come back to it, just fold that piece of foil up, fold the edges over, put it in a bag with a label, and it'll stay good for years. Um, but generally speaking, the more you do it, the less you'll have to do a spore print or check spore color. Um, and then sometimes when you get into the harder stuff, you need a microscope anyway, so you'll be looking at the spores no matter what. Collection and documentation. So sometimes it's necessary to take home a mushroom for further study. You want to collect the whole specimen. That means excavating the base. So if it's an Amanita, you want to like, if you have a pocket knife, dig around it and then try and pry that up without actually like putting your fingers around the mushroom. Because uh, those 
vulvas are a very good identifying feature and without it, most people will just tell you it's an amanita. Uh, you want to start drying it as soon as possible. So if you have a food dehydrator, that's the best. If not, I throw mine on my dash and it kind of just works like an oven. If I just leave them in my car for a week, I'm just not excited about getting pulled over and explaining to a cop that he didn't find anything cool. Um, if you can't do that, like putting them in front of a fan, like if you have an incandescent bulb, like you can put it under that, like anything to start the drying process immediately. You want to get as much moisture out as possible. So if there's bugs or anything living in there, a uh, good way to get, if you know some of your collections are buggy, you can throw them in the freezer first and then throw them in the dehydrator. Um, but yeah, it's, you can even do it in the oven. I've had luck um, just putting it on the lowest setting. It's, I think it's like 150 or something and just throw it in there for a couple hours. You know, if it's during winter, you can just leave the door open and heat up your whole living space while you do it. Uh, paper bags are excellent short-term storage. Um, I know people use them for long-term storage as well, but they usually throw silica packets in there to absorb any uh, moisture that's coming from an outside source. Uh, otherwise, people use plastic bags. As long as they're fully dried, it's not going to be an issue. Uh, you also want to take clear and focused pictures of the specimen. You want to include multiple angles so we can see all the features. Natural light is the best. It captures colors as close to what we would see them as. I can't tell you how many times people have posted a picture in their house under extremely yellow lights asking what something is. I'm like, I can't even tell what color it is. It's... So unless you have a really nice light setup, take pictures outside and in its natural environment in situ. Um, I don't know any that we have on the red list here that I've encountered, um, but if you are concerned about that, I would definitely check out the red list website. Um, but I haven't found anything here that I've learned to be endangered or even threatened. Um, and as far as like, if you're worried about over collection, over foraging, whatever, it's very hard to do that. But the more you take of these things, the less it, or the more it takes away from the overall environment. So like, yeah. So generally they don't spread too much during one season. Like they'll be lucky to get a few inches further away from where they fruited last. Um, but when we start collecting them a whole bunch, we're taking away environments from bugs, all sorts of other stuff that we don't really know the effect of what we're doing. So while we don't need mushrooms to live, like there are insects and bugs and you know microorganisms that need these mushrooms to live. And so if you can avoid collecting anything, if it's not for learning or if, you know, there's an abundant amount of oysters or chicken of the woods or something, you know, take some, leave the rest because it affects the whole environment there a lot more than we understand. Um, but otherwise, collect away. And is the Red List website that you refer to one just about mushrooms? No, I believe it's going to be all, all across the board, yes. Um, yeah, so once you get fairly good at identification, you're going to find that it's going to be impossible to ID things beyond genus unless you have a microscope or unless you want to send it out to have uh, genetic sequencing done on it, which is kind of expensive for the everyday person to do just over and over and over again. So your best bet is probably get a microscope and spend a lot of time playing with it and reading some papers that are going to confuse you and cause you to just read one sentence, look up five words, read one sentence, look up five words. Um, but other than that, I, if you are interested, I definitely think you should get on iNaturalist, create an account there, and um, you'll notice when people ID stuff correctly over and over again. You'll see the people who are good and you can 
kind of follow them and learn. And it has the option to actually follow people and their observations and everything. Um, Facebook groups are good. Um, they're a little, I don't know, it depends on how you feel about Facebook. Uh, I won't go into that one anymore. Um, but yeah, I think that was all I had for that. You guys have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, personally, I do not. I know CTMS just had a couple of classes with Alan Rockefeller uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I would look and see. I don't know if they put those up on the YouTube or not, uh, but they generally like to record stuff and then it goes right up on the YouTube. If not, I'm sure we'll have one again soon. Uh, I just couldn't tell you when. Yes. Uh, probably that Odomenciella, the radicate, section radicate. Um, I hear the caps are good. I've never eaten them, but they're the ones I encounter the most around here. Chicken of the woods, uh, Latiparus species are pretty common. We get this pale one, uh, Gilbertsonii var politis, I think. And that one's pretty good, pretty common. Um, and we do get chanterelles around here. Um, so that's another one to look out for. Mm -hmm. This was a lot of terms that I'm not familiar with. So if I were going to choose a book that kind of went into these terms, uh, which are descriptive terms that help you ID things, mm -hmm. which guide would you think would be good about that? Uh, as far as actually using descriptive terms, like I said, a lot of them keep it uh, fairly non-technical. So as long as you know the description of the word, you can work through those. But if you want something that is a little more technical, David L. Argent put out a series of books. Uh, give me one second. I can find out what they're called. Okay, so they no longer have these in print, but they are very good books. Um, and I think I didn't pay that much for mine. But it is How to Identify Mushrooms to Genus by David L. Largent. And he has, I think it's a series of, I'm not sure how many are in there, but the first four volumes, I believe, are the important ones. So the first one will have all that technical information that you're asking about. The second one has microscopic features. Uh, I believe the third one is a um, identifying to genus in the field book. Um, but they're, they're very good books. And like I said, they're not in print anymore. So if you can find a PDF version online, do it. Yes. Um, so I really like Purgatory in San Marcos, uh, the upper trailhead, not the lower part that's next to, um, yes, yeah, off of Hunter there. And let's see, there's also a trail right off of Lime Kiln. That one I go to just because it's close to my house, but it actually connects to, I think, four other parts of town or something. Center, the parking area and a kiosk that sends you up that trail. Okay. okay. Spring Lake. Spring Lake Preserve. Spring Lake, okay. Okay. Yeah, I knew it connected to a bunch of other spots. I just never... Yeah, basically any spot you can get out there and find just, you know, no sidewalks, you can probably find something. I found stuff at um, 
So the wooden playscape in San Marcos has a park, next, Bicentennial Park, I believe. Um, that one, I found plenty of stuff there. Um, so probably the main places I go that are outside of my property. But yeah, there's there's a lot in San Marcos and the surrounding areas. And if you want to go up north, the Greenbelt entrance off of 360, I think. Um, that one, I found a lot of really good stuff there too. No, let me get in real quick. Yes, sir. Um, well, I mean, not necessarily between other mushrooms, but between anything like uh, bacteria, anything else that's growing out there, um, even like, you know, caterpillars or anything that's going to eat like plant matter that would be broken down eventually. But you can see competition. So like spalted wood uh, has all these black lines in it and has this weird pattern. Every single one of those lines is just, I believe it's melanin that they release and they're creating a boundary that other mushrooms can't pass. So they're saying like, this is my area. So there is competition all the time between them. And really when you see one mushroom fruiting, like it was such a battle for it to do that, probably. Like it's just barely able to do that. Like they're always in competition, but it's not like, I don't think one species is gonna wipe out another one unless we get something invasive here, which a lot of invasive species like to stay up north. Uh, I mean, if they get to the um, substrate first or the food source first, then it's they're probably going to have a stronghold on it and nothing else will get in there. Um, I know up north, the golden oyster is a pretty invasive species and it's doing quite a number up there. Um, but as far as down here, I don't think we have a whole lot to worry about other than other tropical or pantropical species getting over here. Um, but I don't know of any that are as prolific as say like the golden oysters up north. Is it? Anywhere else in Watson and like any Constantine that you guys have ever, like I've seen some stuff online, but I'm just dying to uh, just get them up in like Michigan and in that area like heard about here like yeah so i've heard i've heard tell of some in the austin area but i've never seen anything like that apparently it does happen but we have such an incredibly short window even compared to up there yeah um but if you go out east east texas you can definitely find them so well maybe northeast texas but they're they're definitely there um still get to find any though so let me see if there's any questions on zoom Yeah, you, you need to make sure which one you're in. The photography groups are like, no IDs. Yeah. And then the British Mycological Society is like, if we don't know your name, don't say anything. Yeah. All right, well, I was gonna check. I can't see the chat, let me see. All right. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this one should be uploaded as soon as we finish this, yes. And actually, um, and I know if you follow the Facebook page, they'll they'll post a link up, I believe, or you have to go to their, I'm not really sure. I just do this. Um, but it will be on their YouTube page that you can search for. But unless we have any other questions. Thank you. I'm going to get a